Hey YouTube, Do It Yourself Junkie 369 here today and this is day six of my RV10 build. And this video will probably be day six, day seven, and day eight if I uh, follow the suit of the last video. And that way I can just put it all together, run through real fast where I'm not talking about anything and not have uh, 30 or 40 videos per component, maybe just one or two. So in this video I'm still working on the vertical stabilizer. Uh, not quite halfway through even. Today I've got the skin riveted, or not riveted, but uh, Clicoed on here. So today I'm going to be match drilling, moving Clicos around, more match drilling, take it off, and then maybe if I've got time at the end we can set up the dimpler and see how that works. So once you get these on here, next step is to drill them with a match drill them with a number 40 bit. And in my little package of bits here, they're all facing one way except for the one that I've been using. It faces the opposite direction. So I can keep track of that. And eventually when it does get dull enough, I'll throw it in the trash and then flip another one around to indicate that I'm actively using it. Uh, a note about drill speed. I, in my review, I talked about going faster is better. There is a point that you want to stay under. If you're doing some of the larger holes, your drill speed is going to be maxed out at about 24-2600 RPM. Um, I guess if you do get a drill that's capable of more than that, you can just modulate the speed using the trigger. So let's get some drilling done. curve of the uh, skin around keep perpendicular to that don't go flat across as you're up near the nose can't it forward until the bits perpendicular to the skin and then once you're near the back there's just a little bit aft angle and the Clicos can kind of help out with that.
Now that we have the skin drilled, we need to set this aside. We've got to deburr all the holes in the skin. Later we'll deburr this as well, I'm sure. And then once that's done, then you go through and you dimple the skin. So after deburring, we'll see how all this lines up. And basically the only holes that don't get deburred are the eight along this tab in the top here, since those didn't get drilled. They'll get, get uh, dealt with later, I'm sure. To get these holes down here in the corner, don't be afraid to just push the skin up out of the way. You're not going to bend it far enough for it to take a permanent set. And then, other than that, the biggest deal is not forgetting where you are at, what holes that you've already completed, and it seems so far that building an airplane is a bunch of really simple tasks repeated a billion times. And your main hard part of building an airplane is not to get complacent while you're do repeatedly doing that task over and over again. So always do give 100% to each little thing you do while you're doing it. So right now I'm talking to you, but I'm keeping an eye on where I left off as I scoot this sheet around. Put my hand over it, which hole I need to start on. That way I'm not distracted by talking to you and then missing something like skipping over a hole and not deburring it. And a lot of other people that you watch take a, a soldering iron, melt the blue uh, plastic off in a strip, and then just peel off that strip. Um, if you're careful with it, you can just remove the, the bluing, which is protecting the aluminum from getting scratched, basically. <coughs> so if you take it all off, you have to be careful with it, not to scratch it too bad. But little, little scratches aren't... All, anything to be considered, be concerned with, they'll be uh, covered up when you paint the aircraft, and they'll have to get stuck pretty good with scotch bright to get the primer to adhere properly. And if you leave this blue on there, bluing on there too long, it's not really bluing, but this blue plastic on there too long, it can bond stronger to the aluminum as time goes by, and then you might have a lot of trouble getting it off later. It doesn't 
doesn't say pull it off in the instructions now, but I am deeper in these holes on both sides. Yep, there's definitely a burr there. So I'm, since it says to deburr, I'm pulling the plastic off because I don't feel like you can do a good job deburring with the plastic on there. And then the next step is going to be to dimple these for the counter sunk rivets. And I feel like if you leave the plastic on there, it's going to give you a really bad dimple. Like you won't get a, a good looking dimple with it. So that's just my position on it. Like I said, if you watch enough videos, everybody has their own thoughts. Most of them seem to go with the uh, soldering iron. But in my mind, that just adds extra time. And then you'd have to come back and remove the bluing later anyway. And scuff the plane up so you can paint it. So you saw me uh, clean off the table before I started this. Basically, that was to remove any small metal shavings from drilling or deburring. And that's what's going to cause scratches on your plane or on this skin. So I wanted to get them all off the tables so that this wasn't sliding around on it. And then I'm going to deburr this side with the plastic still stuck to the other side and then flip it over and remove that plastic last while trying not to scoot this around. What are you doing? I'm going to end up with cancer again. Eating metal. Yeah. And probably by the time I get this deburred completely, I'll have to uh, call it quits. That way I can work on this uh, primer comparison video that I want to do. Because I need to have that done before I decide which primer to paint everything. Another thing to remember, which I'm going to have to go back and do it later, since I put the skin away for now, is uh, deeper the edges of that skin. Just like every, the edges of everything else. Well, I was just reading ahead to number seven, and it looks like you take care of this down there. So. We'll, we'll go back to setting up the dimpler, I guess, and figuring out how that works. I guess uh, it pays to read ahead in the plans, so I'll probably start taking this inside while I'm watching TV at night. Sitting there, I'll read through the next couple steps, seeing what I have to do. Uh, I'm not sure if I should count that as part of the build process or not. Comment below and let me know what you think. So for dimpling skins, you have a few options. You can use a hand squeezer or pneumatic squeezer on the edges and a little bit in depending on how far your yokes will reach. To really reach into the middle of the skins, you need a frame dimpler 
such as this one. And this is the type that you hit with a hammer. There's another type out there called the DRDT2 that has a lever and does more of a squeezing type action. And there's some debate as to which is better. Uh, people that own these say they're better. People that own the others say they're better. Um, if somebody's got one that they want to let me borrow, that'd be great. I'd do a side by side comparison on in there and let me know which one you should buy. Other than that, uh, I guess I could compare this to my hand squeezer since the hand squeezer should perform exactly like the DRDT2 or the pneumatic squeezer. It's just hand powered. So it should give consistent rivet dimples as far as I set it up correctly. Where that's what people say about this is it's too hard to be consistent. Uh, we'll find out. When you first get this frame, it'll be in two pieces, that way it's not hard to ship. So you will need to put it together. And that basically means take off this collar. If you want to see how to set up your dimpler and use it, I have a separate video for that. And basically I'll be going through and doing around all the edges. And part of that step is you have to mark some screws or some holes that don't get dimpled. Make sure you get those correct and I'll uh, go over how to mark them right now. Once that's done, you can simply, and you've got your squeezer set up correctly, so real quick I need to review the plans and make some marks on here using a permanent marker. Remember if you use a pencil, it'll actually cause corrosion on the aluminum. And uh, the permanent marker is not so bad. It'll bleed through primer and paint, but so on the inside you could just leave it there and know that any marks you make will show through. On the outside, if you make any marks, after you're done with them, you can just wipe them off with some acetone and not worry about it. So the fairing screws that you need to not dimple, there's 18 of them total. And a good way to figure out where they are is find the lower back corner of the skin. You mark that one. Then you skip one, mark that one for two. Skip two, mark that one. Good night. Good night, Ethan. I love you. Is that dog trying to lick you? Skip two, skip two, mark this one. Skip two, mark one, skip two, mark one. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Skip two, mark. Now skip three. One, two, three. Make mark. And the middle of those three should line up with that, which it does. Then skip two and mark. And then the last three should get dimpled. And then same thing on the other side. So there should be nine per side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So. so this corner, skip one, mark, and skip two. The other eight holes should be fairly obvious. They're four on each side, and they're up here. And the reason I say it should be obvious is because you did not even match drill those and deburr them yet. So they're obviously for something else, which is the fairings. They're the screw holes for the fairings. Now that that's done, we're ready to start dimpling. Everything else will get dimpled. Once that's done, you can simply, and you've got your squeezer set up correctly, pneumatic or hand powered, should be about the same as long as you have an adjustable ram anyway. You go through and dimple every hole that you did not mark. 
if it's marked, it's one of the fairing screw holes, and you want to make sure, absolutely make sure, you don't accidentally dimple that. Because if you dimple one of those, uh, you might have some trouble later on. The nice thing is, if you find yourself uh, with one that's under dimpled for some reason, you can just adjust your squeezer, go back and dimple it a second time. It shouldn't work harden the aluminum too much. Um, or give it another hit with the uh, C frame if that's the one you're using. And what I've just found out here on accident is it's, for me at least, It's easier to start at the bottom and work my way up. And here at the bottom, you're going to want to thin this metal out while you dimple so you can make sure to get your squeezer in there perfect, perpendicular to the skin. That way you're not ending up with a weird cockeye dimple. And this is where match drilling these holes is kind of important because if you don't, the spur sticking out of this uh, die here supposedly won't fit in the hole. And then when you do force it through there, you end up possibly splitting the aluminum, which you don't want to do. And with the three inch yoke, you can go about three holes in is about the deepest you'll be able to run with it. So you will need the C-frame dimpler or a C-frame dimpler of some sort right off the bat. Unless you plan on doing all these in here with a pop rivet dimpler, which I'll include a link below. I don't have one yet. Normally they're just used to get into tight locations um, or areas that your C-frame won't reach. But with this specific C-frame, it should be deep enough that I don't have to worry about using that. Um, of course, if I find out different during my build, I will let you know. Just in case, I'll put the link to that tool down in the description. Um, I would recommend holding off on buying it until you, you see me say otherwise, unless you just want to pick it up, it's fairly cheap. And then as far as the uh, mandrels that you use to compress the two dies together, you can just use finishing nails, which if I buy one, I'll, I'll cover it more in depth than how to use it. Because that's one thing that these videos should be about, in my mind, is sharing in depth how you set up your tools, how you go through the process. I don't know where I picked up this little stool, but um, I'll try to find one and link it because it's been great carrying it places like hunting, uh, car races where I'm sitting on a knoll or something. It's really tiny, only about 18 inches in length. And it's really great around the shop. You can just plop it down somewhere and sit. And it puts me at a really great height to use these really short work tables, work benches.
And it's interesting, most uh, pilots, that's not their only uh, hobby. So other than flying, obviously I'm into building airplanes, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. If you're uh, just looking for a cheap airplane, this is probably not the way to go. You can pick up some pretty good deals buying, and if you're not like into the building aspect of it, enjoy it, then this will just be another job for you to do, and you'll dread doing it, and it'll take forever and seem to drag on, and it'll, it might even turn you off of flying entirely or suck up too much in your time and money so where you can't go flying. Um, <coughs> I haven't been flying since I started this, but also I haven't had time to, the weather hasn't been nice, and I've been uh, sick. So because of that sickness, I'm not ready to go flying. Hopefully that goes away soon. I know I have a bunch of friends waiting. They've, uh, one of the guys that watches almost all my videos, he's been asking me every day, well not every day, but seems like it, when I plan to go flying next, because he's, he's ready to go up. He's gone up once with me. And it's supposed to be a cross country, but because of weather, we just kind of stayed around the airport and did a short, uh, like half hour flight, hour flight, something like that. And uh, we really want, I really want to get him up on a cross country trip and go somewhere like back to where he lives and maybe stop for some barbecue because uh, for me anyway like I like just flying around but originally I got into it because I want to travel I want to go somewhere I want to use it that ability for work where I can get somewhere where the airports closer than the commercial one and I'm taking off from the airport just by my house so that's closer to the commercial one and the trip instead of being six hours long because I'm sitting in an airport for two hours waiting, plus a two hour layover, I can make that same flight in a Cessna 172 in three hours and not lose my luggage, be able to take my concealed carry weapon with me when I go on travel to some of the more dangerous locations. Uh, dangerous being like LA, although I can't conceal carry out there, so it'd be kind of a, a neat point. But there's other locations too that aren't so great that when you're in a hotel, it just, I don't sleep very well. Knowing, uh, when people are like, oh, you're, you're just being paranoid or whatever. But part of it is not so much paranoia, but trying to be prepared. That way, the worst thing you can have to do is like think, oh, it can't happen to me. Because about the time you... Anyway, it's getting pretty late, and... Part of working on this is I really don't want to work on it when I'm tired, and I start getting distracted. So far, I've been doing good about that, but also... I'm in the middle of doing the primer test, so I, I have the primer, or the samples painted for that video, and they've dried, and it's coming up on the 24 hour mark that they've been drying, so now I need to actually start running the test for that video, and I'm looking forward to seeing what the results are, because pretty soon here, in a couple more steps, I'm going to be putting this stuff together, and before you do that, you really ought to prime it. You don't have to prime, but I have reasons that I feel like priming is out. I, have, I feel like the priming outweighs the, the t additional time that you spend doing it and the additional weight that you add to the airframe. And hopefully, I, I mean, I kind of covered it in the priming video, at least I think I did. Basically, I'm looking at, while I might not live near a coastal area where there's salt water, I do plan on flying this thing to the Bahamas. Um, otherwise, why bother building it? Uh, that's one of my favorite places to go diving. So it'll be in salt air during that time. I, 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 most of my family lives in coastal areas. We grew up there. We enjoy coastal areas, so I want to visit those quite often. And I mean, that's the whole reason I got into flying in the first place was to travel since I don't live near a coastal area. But then also, uh, the area I live is one of the highest area, or one of the areas with the highest humidity in the entire US, which seems kind of like a bogus fact that somebody made up, but for whatever reason, it, it is, even though I'm not really near any coastal area. And then also, it, it, it would help the resale value because somebody's going to look at it and go, oh, this is primed on the inside. Uh, I probably don't have to worry about Corrosion. Um, 
Now, I say that, but it's kind of a more of a thing for you guys to think about because, quite honestly, I, I don't ever plan on selling this thing. It's going to go to either my son or my daughter whenever I hit the point where I can no longer fly. Um, of course, by that time, maybe they'll own their own aircraft that I've helped them build, which would be really cool. And maybe I do end up having to sell it. I'd prefer to give it to one of them, though. Hopefully they enjoy flying as much as I do. But it, it's more of a just-in-case and for you guys to think about, because maybe you're building this, or not this, but maybe you're building like a RV-10, or not a 10, this is a 10. Maybe you're building like an RV-12 or something for your first aircraft, or an RV-14. That one looked really awesome, by the way. I, I was looking at it today. Um, the 9 is supposed to be more of a cross-country machine, but I'll, I'll have to do a comparison to the RV-14. I think the RV-14 might be, in my mind, the best two-seat aircraft, unless you want a light sport, which I think the RV-12 is a pretty dang good aircraft as well. But for pure performance, you get acrobatic capability, you get side-by-side -side seating so the person isn't stuck in the back seat like with no visibility, and you get a 50-gallon tank and the ability to carry like just over 500 pounds with full tanks and 100 pounds of baggage if you take a little less people or a little less fuel and like well over six hour endurance if you fly at 55 percent power settings so it just seems like a, a great aircraft and uh, if I get to build two that either the 12 or the 14 would be next on my list um, although I feel like I've been copying uh, Tim up in Wisconsin where he built a 10 and he turned around and built a 14 but he's obviously a smart guy, has great taste, and picked a, a great second aircraft. So maybe you start out building the 14 or the 12, and eventually you decide that you need to step up to the 10 or go with something else, or you just have the desire to build another aircraft, but you need to sell the first one to do it. I think the uh, primer on the inside for corrosion protection would give you a better resale value. And so I want to point that out to you guys. Well, that is everything I can reach with this hand squeezer. It's late, so I'm going to call it a night. But I'm going to come back and set up the C-frame tomorrow. Actually, I might do it now. And knock out the rest of those dimples. And part of what I want to think about is when you're using the C-frame on this bit piece, will you be able to feed it through this way, which looks like all except for this one might be okay. You won't bend the skin out too much. Or will you have it flipped over this way so you're hitting the dimples from the inside? And that basically covers how you set up your dimple dies. So I'm planning on doing it this way with uh, the protrusion dimple being on the bottom. And it just seems like a more natural position to hold the skin in. Uh, we'll see if it works out once I get the uh, whole setup set up and actually try to use it. In my video, I had these dies switched around and I was trying to dimple the skin in this orientation. And it just, I ended up scratching up the skin a little bit because the aluminum alcad surface is pretty soft. And then also, I was having to hunt for the die and try to get that in the skin without being able to see it really. So I flipped that around, and I'll just have to deal with holding the skin hanging off the table, which I can do as a single person operation. I just was hoping to avoid pushing the skin real close to 90 degrees here. It also looks like I won't be able to reach this skin, the dimple it, unless I... There's two holes here that I can't quite reach with this model. But I can do, I can reach it in this orientation. So I guess when it comes time to do those four holes in there, 
I will uh, flip the dodge around so that I can dimple with the good surface or the outside surface of the skin facing down. And I'll just have to be careful, maybe put some tape around it so I don't scrape the skin up. And other than that, make sure I hit it harder than normal. And make sure I get that good dimple first time around. And as I put in my how to use this machine video, you want a platform to support skins you're working on, and that kind of frees up your hands. And then you want to line up the holes and push the ram or the uh, anvil, whatever you want to call this part that you're going to hit, the top post, down through the skin. That way you're holding it there, you're controlling everything, and you won't end up with a uh, spare lightning hole. And then give it two to three whacks depending on how hard you swing this hammer. I've been swinging it too lightly, so I've had to use four hits. But you'll notice how the sound changes, and usually that means you've got a good dimple form. Yep. And you want a little ring around there from the outside edges of the die. Seems like as I get more comfortable with this, I'm starting to swing the hammer a little bit harder. Um, not quite as hard as I'd swing to drive a uh, framing nail. Um, those usually I can drive in about two or three hits. And I think that would cause some serious damage if I swung that hard. Plus, I'm trying to be a little bit more controlled so I don't miss this top post. Uh, miss hits on this top post is what's going to cause it to mushroom over. As long as you get a good square hit, uh, this tool should last through several aircraft. Basically, as I said, couldn't quite reach these two in this orientation, so I'll leave that undimpled. And there's several options to get to those. One is you can flip the dies over and come in this way or this way with the C-frame, or you can get a pop rivet dimpler, which I'll, uh, I'm not sure if I'll get it, we'll see, because I know I can reach these when I flip the dies around. Or you can go kind of take that post off, take this off, hold it on there, have somebody hit the hammer for you, um, or have like a hole in a heavy piece of metal to act as your bucking bar and then drive it in there with the uh, rivet gun. There's quite a few options. Uh, since I can reach this one with the C-frame if I swap the dies around, I'll probably only show that method. I'm a little less sure about the other ones and it's really easy to get like the dies not lined up correctly or perpendicular to the skin, which is uh, something that I want to try to avoid. So my rule is kind of go for the easiest method that ensures the best results or a compromise of the results that you want. Which swapping the Perfect. Well, I don't know about perfect, but I don't see any pillowing from under under dimpling anywhere which is what I was aiming for. Really convinced that putting the collar on top with the spring underneath is the way to go for this. And I have it adjusted just to push this up high enough so I can slide the skin through there without it scraping across there. And basically, uh, there's another feature that I 
really hadn't noticed on other models of this, just the uh, aviation tool supply one, that kind of turns this into a single handed operation or a single person operation. And basically now I'm placing this die on the bottom so I can flip the skin over good side down or sorry outside face down because the throat isn't deep enough to reach those two holes near the nose but in this orientation Instead of going in with the skin this way, which isn't long enough, I can go in with the skin this way. And part of the reason I can't just run the skin in there is because of this support. It's too long to put it in there without trying to unbend this nose too much or leading edge too much. Um, I guess if I wanted to get somebody else to hold this for me, and I could use, just support it off the edge of the table and have this right next to the edge of the table. I could do it without switching the dies around. So that's two options for you. One way you'll be able to do it yourself. The other way you'll have to have a spare hand. And those dimpled really nicely. I basically gave them an extra hit each with the hammer because I had under dimpled in that orientation previously. So that should be all of step five. Correction, step five was marking the holes that we didn't need to dimple. Step six was dimpling all the holes. So I'm a little bit ahead. <coughs> So even in the plans it says depending on what uh, model or vintage of the C-frame you have, you won't be able to reach all the holes and they use the pop rivet dimpler. Um, as I just showed you, you can reach those as long as you get creative with the Aviation Tool Supply C-frame. That is actually an RV C-frame and they even state that they've extended out the throat of it for our, specifically for RVs. So we're done with dimpling skins for now. Next step is to dimple some, uh, well, to take the ribs apart, deburr the holes, and then to dimple those holes. So we'll go ahead and break this tool down and get it out of the way so we can continue the work. And this was the step that I had originally started a couple steps back before I realized, oh, we'll get to that later. And one thing I've read from learn, reading online is, even if you think it's a good idea, you probably should follow the steps in order exactly as described. Uh, a couple people that have said, oh, I should uh, skip this and do this now, usually take the time to read ahead. And then they come back and go, oh, that's why it was done that way. And uh, if you go ahead and just do something, uh, it might not be such a big deal here in the vertical stabilizer. But I know like when you're starting to 
put the empennage on the uh, fuselage. If you do some stuff in the wrong order, like let's say, for example, you dimple some holes that you think need to be dimpled, later on you might find out that they're countersunk, and because you dimpled them, stuff won't quite go together correctly. Or it'll be difficult to get parts to line up correctly. And that was one of the posts that I read over at Vans Air Force. Um, in case you guys have, don't know about it or are planning on building an RV, that is a great source for information. And basically, you can just Google Vans Air Force. It's a form. It's uh, free to join. Although, I do suggest supporting them in whatever way you can. And it is one of the things that a lot of people go with Vans Aircraft because of that community. It's called Vans Air Force because there's... Uh, so many Vans aircraft out there flying, basically Van created his own Air Force. But it's a great place to meet other builders, talk to them, get knowledge from them. Uh, a naval architect that I'm familiar with, one of his sayings was, don't waste time redesigning something that's already been done. Uh, take what somebody else has already been done and then go from there. So at Vans, Air Force, that's a good place to learn what everybody else has already done, what knowledge they have, and then eventually move on from there and maybe come back with something of your own that nobody else knows about. And share that with everybody so they, we, the whole community as a whole can continue to grow together, become better aircraft builders, and make better aircraft. And just have fun talking to each other. So basically now it's time to deburr. So basically now it's time to deburr all the holes that we match drilled beforehand. So that's, it says all the rib holes, but uh, I'll read ahead here in a minute. And I'm probably going to deburr all the uh, spar holes as well that got match drilled, which is basically from these two Clecos on up and all these holes in here, these holes are fine, but these three holes probably need to be deburred. Now I'm thinking, if it doesn't say it somewhere in the next few instructions, that it probably just was kind of glossed over or I need to go back and read it again, maybe I missed it. I definitely know it's not in one of the steps I checked off. get machine countersunk, or some holes in here, get machine countersunk and deburred later. So I didn't see anything about this yet, but I'll set it aside. And if I get to the point where I'm about to rivet something together to this, I'll just make sure to deburr it then. But it does appear that when they say deburr just the rib holes, deburr just the rib holes. And that's where it pays to read forward, but also to follow each step exactly and uh, almost don't question it. I mean, it is good to question it, but uh, don't just read forward a little bit. It might be several steps down that you do something else or several pages. So you want to uh, almost err on the side of caution and say like, oh, I, I, need, I know I need to deburr those uh, spars, but you know what? I'll hold off right until the point where I'm about to rib it. And if I haven't been told to deburr them by then, go back and deburr them. But don't go like, oh, I need to deburr these and deburr them right now. There might be uh, some machine countersinking or something going on later, maybe several pages in, 
that basically you wasted your time deburring holes that are going to get machine counter sunk out and will need to be deburred after that process. So then you'll be deburring them again. So don't, don't be afraid to question the plans, but at the same time err on the side of just following them exactly. Uh, something over the 500 aircraft, or maybe it was 200, somewhere along that lines, quite a few aircraft have been built off these plans. There have been revisions, but I'm going off the side of if there was a mistake, somebody probably would have said something by now and had it changed. And we're heading into spring. A bit, there's a mosquito flying around my garage because I have the door open. So if you see me swatting around, I'm not losing my mind. There's just a mosquito in here that I've been trying to squish for the past hour that I've been out here. And then, uh, I don't remember if it was the start of today or one of my other videos, I mentioned lightning hole. And I gotta admit, when I first started working on aircraft, I did not know what a lightning hole was. Especially since I was reading it, and it spelled lightning, like the giant electrostatic discharge that flies out of the uh, storm clouds and hits the earth. Or, depending on how you look at it, out of the earth and hits the storm clouds. And so I was kind of confused, like, what the heck is a lightning hole? And why is it on an aircraft? But it's lighting, lightning as in I'm lighting, the, making the part lighter. So these are lightning holes. They're cut in here. They don't really impact the strength that much, but they make the part a lot lighter. So it's that kind of lightning. Um, so that way, if you're sitting out there wondering the same thing I was, now you know. And don't feel too bad, because as I just admitted, I was thinking the same thing. Um, of course, if you knew better than me, go ahead and make fun of me. I don't care. I, I felt stupid enough when I realized that you're not going to make me feel any dumber by leaving some sort of comment. This deburring tool obviously won't work in there, so it's a good time to break out that uh, large drill bit tray. And I specifically set my drill bit aside somewhere. And it, it just has to be larger than the hole that you're doing. So like those are drilled out to be number 40 to match up with the 3 seconds rivets. So 3 16 drill bit is a good one that will have lots of clearance to fit in there and you just spin it around once or twice. And then uh, I haven't really seen it talked about anywhere in the plans but there's a small hole here and a small here, hole here. And one thing that's good for is telling which way this part goes in by look, because they are drawn on the, uh, the plans. So it gives you a good idea of which way this thing faces. But I think originally, mainly what they were for is locator pins for when you're creating the part. You stick this down over two pins, it's locked into position, and boom, you create the part. And it's not moving around during the part creation. So that's my theory on what it is. Um, it's probably also a good area to run wiring. Like stick a grom in there, feed a couple wires through. So, uh, yeah, just in case you're wondering what those are for, I think they were just to locate parts. And now that I've thought about it, I don't think I deburred these. So I should run a deburring tool on there. I did get the lightning holes when I was deburring the edges of the part. And 
because I was waving that around, I forgot which holes I deburred. But a quick check here shows me that it was these. So, real easy. Just pick up where I left off and keep going. And uh, basically the next step is you want to figure out what holes line up with the holes you did not dimple in the skin. And then you're going to mark those and dimple the remaining holes so that the skin can nestle inside that dimple. And better get good at this practice if you are uh, building one of these aircraft because they do use pretty much flush rivets everywhere on the outside skin. And that's one part that makes them so fast and so efficient is because they are very aerodynamically well designed. Almost better than some of the composite aircraft that are out there. And the composites might be smoother looking and maybe a little bit better looking uh, depending on your taste. But it, it seems like they, they did a very good job of making this very aerodynamically efficient, maybe even on the level of those composite aircraft, or possibly better. And pretty much if you read the front matter of the manual, it talks about pre, uh, how it goes for basic designs, not because it's easy or been done so much, but because there's sound engineering reasons behind having a tractor type airframe and uh, stuff like that that's proven benefits and that's part of the reason their design is maybe not anything too off the wall and the theory is as long as an air if an aircraft looks good like a good aircraft it's probably going to fly good And one thing I had seen uh, briefly, and I couldn't, I'd seen it a long time ago, and I, I went looking for it today, and I just barely found something on it. But you might want to round off the nose of these ribs. Uh, this one, it might matter a little bit less. But th these have a tendency to poke into the skin and push out a little dimple or dent. And so people have talked about rounding these off more than what they are. And I could have sworn it was something that was fixed. But when I put the skin on, I ended up with just a real slight dimple or dent on the midrib and the, uh, the top one as well. Well, and maybe a little bit down at the bottom. So it seems like I, I should, probably should have rounded these. But I, I didn't think it was necessary any longer. I thought maybe that had been fixed. Um, I could have sworn I also read somewhere that that only happens if you attach the skin to one side completely and then tried to fold the other side in. If you follow the instructions on the manual exactly, if you attach evenly from the nose back, you don't run into that problem. Um, somebody comment below, let me know if you've come across that. I know several people have had that dent put in their airplane.
but I could have sworn at least one or two people out there, and hopefully you see this and will comment, have said that as long as you follow the directions exactly and you go nose back equally on both sides, then you don't uh, put a dent in your vertical stabilizer skins. And while I'm thinking about it, a little bit on aircraft terminology of parts. This is a spar. So a spar is like the main cantilevered beam that runs through an object. It's like the backbone, basically. So in the vertical stabilizer, you have a, a rear spar and then a front spar. And those basically are the main support that ties into the rest of the fuselage somewhere. Off the spars, you have ribs. So think backbone like your backbone, and then off your backbone is where your rib cage comes off of, or your ribs. So that's what these are. They, they uh, basically go out and support all the structure, but they take all the forces and then transfer that into that spar. And wings are made the same way. They're just, they usually have a main spar. Some wings might have two spars, but they'll run out from the fuselage out to the wing tip. And then the ribs will come off that, and you'll have like a nose rib, maybe a, a center rib, and maybe a, like a trailing edge rib. What? You want to go get some flip flops or something? And then possibly, like inside the fuselage, especially, uh, you'd have upright pieces. And if I remember, and then possibly, like inside the fuselage, especially. Uh, you'd have upright pieces and if I remember correctly those are either called they could be called ribs, they could also be called frames and then tying those together is uh, longerons. Good night Allison, I love you. So basically it's real easy to uh, look at a part and go like oh this is a spar based on the shape of it and where it attaches, we know these are ribs. And, and they're all going to kind of have basically that same look. So that'll give you that'll help you out a little bit when you're reading plans, looking for parts, like uh, automatically, because this is uh, not open and it doesn't have a, a solid flange, it's a good bet that it's a rib. If it had a solid flange along it, it's a good bet it's a spar because on the spar, they're not going to break up that flange because that's where the strength comes from. It's basically an I-beam type design. It's just that it's only one half of the I-beam. So when you have bending forces on it, most of the force is showing up, or most of the stress or compression is showing up in that flange. The center section of it really isn't doing that much. And that's part of the reason you can have the lightning holes in it, because all the forces that you're seeing are out here. If you want me to, I could do a quick video, well, it probably won't be a quick video, but I could do a video on that um, where I break out the statics book and actually show you how it works and how the forces work inside of a beam, which is basically what your spars are. But that's why I-beams are shaped the way they are, the cross-section of them is that way, because on the outer edges, that's where all the forces are at. And the center section is really there just to support the two outer edges and to tie the two together. Um, in the center of the beam, almost always, there's a point where it's zero force. There's no compression or no stretching going on in that part of the beam. So really, you could cut that out, and as long as it's con the two halves are connected together somehow, somewhere, that wouldn't matter because that part's not actually doing anything other than tying the two halves together. So if you think about it from an engineering standpoint, wings of an airplane are nothing more than giant cantilever beams that have a uh, constant load across them for lift 
but then they also sometimes see uh, point loads in specific spots depending on what's going on. And then a lot of the, the like twisting forces that you would get is actually spread around by the skin between several components. And it's the actual aircraft skin that is providing you a good deal of the aircraft's rigidity and structure. And then a lot of the, the like twisting forces that you would get is actually spread around by the skin between several components and it's the actual aircraft skin that is providing you a good deal of the aircraft's rigidity and structure Man, that thing was flying right in my face versus the skeleton and that's where the whole monocot design comes in the ribs are just there kind of to support the skin and the skin is actually carrying the load. But I'm an engineer and a nerd, so I find stuff like that interesting. So, after you deburr the holes in the ribs, you need to dimple the holes except for the ones that match up with these that you marked. So, the first hole that you marked here in the lower corner, that is actually on the rear spar. And then from there, so from the end, this one gets dimpled, the second one does not, and then you skip two, and that one does not, you skip two, that one does not get dimpled, you skip two, that one does not get dimpled, you skip two, that one does not get dimpled, and you skip two, and that one does not get dimpled. So basically, the center hole of each one of these flanges is the one that doesn't get dimpled. And you'll probably want to make sure to mark both sides of those. You do want to dimple the hole on the small flange. It specifically calls that out on both sets of ribs. The other holes that aren't going to get dimpled is in part VS-1005, which is the lower nose rib. Basically, your front spar is this vertical line here, and then this one sits in front of that. So from the front, you have one, two, three, and then this hole does not get dimpled, and then you skip two, and this hole does not get dimpled. And just copy that to the other side. And now you know, as you go through and dimple these, make sure not to dimple the ones you circle. And it's just that lower rib set that has that problem. All the rest of the holes should get dimpled. Matching up with the skins and where you dimpled them. And basically that dimple is going to allow this dimple to sit inside the dimple on the rib so that the two pieces mesh together well, and when you rivet, rivet them, there's no real gap between the material, or the two surfaces.
And on small parts like this, dimpling, it's just going to be easier to use the squeezer. And that's one thing I've always wondered about watching uh, other people work, why they didn't use the Z-frame on the edges of the skin. Instead, they went for their squeezer every time. And I was always kind of curious about that. And what I figured out is they're doing And on small parts like this, dimpling, it's just going to be easier to use the squeezer. And that's one thing I've always wondered about watching uh, other people work, why they didn't use the Z-frame on the edges of the skin. Instead, they went for their squeezer every time. And I was always kind of curious about that. And what I figured out is they're doing that because once you get up close to that edge on the table with the C-frame, there's a whole lot of skin there being unsupported and it makes it really difficult. So it's just easier to use the squeezer. And same thing with this, it's just going to be easier well, to use the squeezer. And on this, you're going to want to make sure to set the die with the protrusion on it on the ram. That way, you can fit inside this flange. And then I like to basically screw these together to where they're supposed to be, and then screw the adjustment out another half a turn to make sure I'm not under dimpling. And then if you notice, every time I squeeze, I check the rivet that, it, or the, every time I squeeze, I check the dimple that I just formed, but I'm also looking and making sure that I'm skipping the holes that I need to skip. Because that would be the worst thing to do at this point, is dimple the wrong hole. And most people online seem to go with if you dimple the wrong hole, just go ahead and buy a new part. Um, I guess this piece right here is less than $2, so it's no big deal to buy a new part. And remember, my goal is to try to go for perfect. So their argument is, hey, strive for perfection, and it's better to start with a new part than to try to fix the part that you just messed up. Um, I don't know what shipping would be on this part. Probably not too bad. It might set you back like 15 to 20 bucks as long as you didn't live overseas, I guess. And it might be a good, uh, basically, like slap on the wrist to remind you, hey, pay attention to what you're doing. Take this, it should let the skin just sit right in there. Looks like it does. It's always good when stuff works out like that. So I went ahead and nippled the part that needed skipped holes on it first. And I'm going to do that again. Dimple this one first because it requires the most patience and attention paid to it to make sure I don't accidentally dimple. hole that I'm not supposed to. And everybody makes a big deal about getting really good dimple dies. And there's a, uh, everybody seems to agree that spring back dimple dies are the best. Uh, they're really expensive. I got this pair from ATS, and it's not the Springback ones, but I have to say, I am really impressed with the dimple that these dies are making. And just a reminder, don't forget the dimple, the little tab, but you want to make sure not to do any of the ends. 
Um, those more than likely are going to get regular domed head rivets. And uh, it's where the most strength is needed because this part, remember, is transferring its stress into the spar. So, especially since it's not out in the airstream, flowing over the parts, putting a uh, countersunk rivet in there is kind of a waste of effort and maybe some strength as well. Uh, that's assuming the dome head rivets are stronger than the countersinks, which I don't remember when I worked in the re repair depot, if that was ever talked about or covered. I think most of the repairs I designed all used dome rivets. It's just a question of getting the right diameter to give you the appropriate strength for the repair that you were making. Other than that, it was all on the frames. So earlier when I was talking about instead of ribs in the fuselage, you have frames. Uh, I'm pretty sure I got that terminology right. It's, it's frames. But since those are interior parts, that get held together. They, I don't think they ever used the countersinks. <coughs> and I'm having trouble remembering, but from what I remember, at least on Boeing aircraft, it seems like a lot of the exterior skin rivets might be domed rivets as well. which might come down to countersinks So far I've noticed around a couple of these lightning holes it's kind of hard to get in there and perpendicular to the uh, metal and it seems like if you go from this orientation perpendicular to kind of rotate it one way or the other it'll slide right in there no problem quick check of the plans there to make sure i'm not forgetting something or doing something that i'm not supposed to be doing I guess they make special dies that are supposed to be for the interior structure. I really haven't seen any aircraft kits call those out as needed. And uh, after dimpling the one rib and placing it in here, it doesn't appear like it's a special die is needed either. They seem to mesh together really well using the same die on the skins and the interior structure. Um, of course, feel free to comment below and tell me I'm wrong. So that was step seven complete. Moving on to step eight, we have to machine countersink the holes that are common with the skin and the rear spar caps, this piece on the inside here. So basically starting at this hole up here, down to here is the skin and spar cap common holes. The only deal is because this hole was marked as do not dimple on the skin, you do not machine countersink it. So really you start one hole up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Should be about 24 holes. And they have should be about 24 holes. And they have uh, in figure two on the page actual holes highlighted so that it makes it a little bit easier to determine which ones. And you need to make that machine countersink counter sink deep enough that the skin dimple sits in there and it lays flush. So it might be worth grabbing a piece of scrap aluminum and setting up your countersink, which I will cover in a separate video before going and doing this step. That way you can check it out on how to set up the micro stop and the countersink. And so before I had not ordered the number 30 countersink and I was waiting on it, well now we get to do some countersinking with the number 40 countersink, which I do have because I accidentally ordered it. And it turns out I needed it a lot sooner than I thought I would. 
And while you're doing this countersinking, you want the spark caps clicoed in place. So I have to go back and add a whole bunch of clicos here to uh, get those held in place where before I start doing the countersinking. And uh, I'll probably do that in. Uh, I'll probably do that tomorrow since it is getting late. So I might add the clicos real quick and then call it quits and come back tomorrow and finish this. And for me, this is uh, really addicting. Almost rather be out here doing this over everything else. So it's like once I get started, I really don't want to stop. But there's other stuff in life, and I want to make sure that I don't neglect any of that, like getting enough sleep so I can go to work tomorrow. Um, on the weekends, I was planning on working longer hours on this project, but so far I've run into needing to do other household projects. So I've been trying to average roughly two hours a day, um, which does not quite get me the 20 hours a week that my coworkers and I determined that I would need in order to make this build in two years at basically 2,000 hours. But I might be wrong, but it also seems like uh, work is progressing faster than I thought it would. So basically, I'm holding judgment on that until I see how long the FNH kit takes me. It takes me like 200 hours. I know I'm uh, working faster than probably most people can. If it takes me something closer to 400 hours, uh, that seems to be what most people say it takes them. But I also question how exact the people are being about tracking their time. I know you're, everybody's supposed to do a build log, which uh, I posted mine online. But I don't know how many people are starting and stopping a stopwatch when they're out working on the plane. So I think it'll be provide some really interesting insights for other builders for me doing it that way. And I have done some research into Clicos and it does appear and I have done some research into Clicos and it does appear that not all Clicos are created equal and uh, some of them once you dimple a hole might be loose enough to fall out and then some of them are tighter in those dimpled holes but they might be fairly impossible to get into a punched hole before it's been match drilled. Uh, these are the ones from ATS are Clico lock I want to say those are the ones that are real tight fitting in those punched holes. And in fact, there's been a couple holes I haven't been able to fit these into. And even after I match drilled, I've had trouble getting those, these into the match drilled hole. And I guess if I had the choice, you probably could get both kinds just to be safe. I guess if I had to go for a choice, I want to go for the one that's tight fitting and just deal with the pain of trying to get it into a hole. And putting the click over right here because that's the hole where the countersinking starts and we don't want to countersink that hole, which is the bottom of the skin, the one that did not get dimpled. So that's kind of my indicator of where to start. And then from there, I click O about every fourth hole. That way, you, you could do every other. And there is an argument for the more click O's in there, the more security you have it, the better off you are. 
but I also think it kills a whole bunch of time having to move those Clicos around, and then it also takes quite a bit of Clicos to do it that happen. And so every other hole is best. Every skipping two holes seems to work fine. Skipping three holes and Clicoing every fourth hole seems to be pushing it. Um, any more than that, you seem to just be asking for trouble and for your parts not to be lined up. So if you're planning on Clicoing every other hole, uh, whatever Clico numbers I've listed in my build tracker, you probably want to double that number. Just to give you a heads up on that. So let's click those together. I need to set up the countersink with the micro stop and we're going to do that tomorrow. Only irritating thing that I've found so far, far about these drill bits is uh, normally bits are marked on the shank what size they are. I left this checked in the drill since last time I drilled and I just realized there's no such marking on here. If you need to learn how to set up your micro stop and how to use that, check out my video on that. Um, so I have it set up and basically, so now it's simply taking this and drilling the holes, switching the clicos over and drilling the holes that I missed. And basically it goes from the top of the rear spar cap, which is this piece on the inside here, down to the bottom of the skin. Except for that, that very bottom corner of the skin did not get dimpled, so you do not countersink that hole. And that's all you want to do for the number 40 machine countersink. And on this one, the instructions state to have that rear cap click out in place while you do this. And I'm pretty sure it looks like that countersink is going to go into that rear cap some, just because of the depth of it and the thickness of this rear spar. And I was uh, saw me take a break there and come down here and check it, that's because even though I had set that tool up correctly as I was countersinking, it just seemed like I was going too deep, but checking out on the skin, I showed that the skin was fitting up properly, I uh, backed it out one click, or two clicks, and tested a hole and it didn't fit, I went in one click, it didn't fit, so I went back in the two clicks, and it fit again, it just seemed like I was going really deep, but it turned out to be the correct depth. And that's one thing, when you're doing the setup, make sure you push as hard as you're going to push when you're doing the actual hole. Otherwise, you might end up with the hole too deep, and it does pay to check every once in a while. So now, that was step eight. Step nine is to disassemble. I would uh, mark which side is the front of these pieces so that you can make sure to install them exact same way. And then as I stated earlier, mark one of these as the top. That way you know which one, which position they all go in so you can make sure to put them back the exact same way. 
pretty much at this point you've drilled everything on here a second time from last time you deburred it. So deburr it all. Uh, the holes that is. You should uh, have no problem with the edges since you already deburred those earlier. So we'll fire up the Kiko pliers here and get this thing apart. Now on these countersink holes, with the way it cut, there's no burr out here, but there is a burr on the inside, so I'm going to skip deburring this outside surface here, but I will be touching the inside up with the uh, drill bit that I use for knocking the burr off inside this spar. So it turns out the burr I thought I was feeling on the countersunk holes was just the uh, inside edge of the hole where there's fairly sharp. Uh, once I started looking at them closer, there's no burr on that side either. And because the, the skin's real thin there, it's real easy for the drill bit to get caught on that and to mess that hole up more than it helps it. So I'll just pass on deburring those as well. And pretty much at the speed that countersink's spinning, and how it cuts, it's probably not leaving all that much of a uh, burr anyway compared to a drill bit. Um, or at least that's what it appears on this piece. Maybe if the countersink wasn't deep going into the spar cap, it would uh, be creating more of a burr on the backside edge where it didn't cut through versus this one. No burr on any of those countersunk holes. That's pretty nice. Now I guess if there was and you need to take it off, I would go with some uh, a Scotch Brite pad or something else, or a 3M wheel, rather than the drill bit because the drill bit's going to snag on that real thin metal there from the countersink being cut out and just uh, really mess up that hole. Again, from there up, all those holes have a bit of a countersink in them, so I'm skipping those. On that, the material is a lot thicker, so I will hit up the back, which definitely has a burr on it.
So, once again, the instructions don't say anything about deburring any of the holes on the front spar. If you flip the page and read instruction number one, boom, that's where you deburr that after you clamp something here and match drill it. So we'll set that aside for now. And we've completed step eight. So it's on to step nine. Or actually, take that back. We've completed step nine, which I was or actually Take that back. We've completed step nine, which I was deburring all that stuff. Now we're on to step ten. And step ten is to take the rear spar here and above your countersink holes, dimple all those holes. And make sure you have the dimple on the outside here going in, obviously. Basically, uh, while I'm out here, I have the timer running to keep track of my time, but I never really look at it until the end, or until I, I need to call it quits. So I'm not trying to hit a certain time or anything, right now anyway. Um, mainly I look at my watch once in a while and go like, oh, it's getting late, I need to stop. Um, but it seems like every time I finish a step, I read the next step and go, oh, I can, I can knock that out before I call it quits. And uh, that probably leads to me working on this a bit longer than I normally do. But there we go, step 10 complete. I know there's one last step to this page, and it's drilling out these holes to a number 12. I do not believe I have a number 12 bit yet, so I have to pick one of those up and do that step. And I think that's a step where I can uh, highlight it, mark it with a marker, and come back later to it. So, sure enough, I'm supposed to drill these out to a number 12 on all the rudder brackets. I don't have that bit, so I'm flagged it for later. And now I turn the page to 6-4. And if uh, you aren't familiar with the plans, every page starts back at step 1. Which I find a little bit odd, but I guess it keeps the uh, step numbers from getting too high. Even though you're not really on step 1, you're, you're, it's kind of a continuous process. Although, so far what I've noticed is if you skip some steps, you, you might not be able to skip step 7 and go to step 8. But if you skip some steps and circle back around to step 1 on the next page, usually you're at a point where you can start working again without having to worry about those previous steps. That might not always be true, but that's what I've seen them run into so far. So, uh, to an extent. I mean, if I had skipped a lot of the first page, I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of the second page. But machine countersink and the holes that I need a number 30 countersink for, I could skip that step and continue on, and it didn't impact my work progress. I was able to continue without hitting a stop point. And I'm still waiting for that to come in. If I had to guess, it'll be here tomorrow, so I'll be able to knock it out on day 10 of the build. And basically get that and the number 12 bit and be able to be current up to 6 4. Um, right now I'm trying to get the blue one off this piece, and I can't seem to get. Get started anywhere. Oh, there we go. Okay, so simple step, stick this together, match drill those holes, take them out, deburr. Um, I want to keep working, but it is definitely getting late, so I need to wrap this video up. I uh, hope you liked the video. If you want to get notified when I upload a new video, please hit the subscribe button and maybe hit that bell icon, although once in a while you'll get notifications about videos I'm uploading that aren't dealing with my RV10 build. Uh, down in the description, there's links to tools that I'm using, as always. There's also a link to my bid log, which has some useful information. It's uh, daily updated to the exact number of hours I'm working on each part, and whether that's admin prep or actual build time. Uh, the money I've spent on this is updated real time. And also, 
every time I use new tools. So like, let's say one day I use 30 Clicos, I note that. If I come back a few days later and I use 100 Clicos, I note that. That way, if you're considering building this and you don't want to buy all the tools at once, you can look at that list and kind of determine how many days out you need to order tools. And for me, uh, I get stuff from Aviation Tool Supply. As much as I mention them, you'd think I was sponsored, but I'm not. Uh, but they are uh, really close to where I'm at, and even their cheapest delivery usually shows up at my doorstep two days from when I order it. And they also seem to have better prices than I've seen anywhere else. About the only thing that I've been able to get cheaper is Clicos. I talked to an EAA member. If you're not a member and considering this, you should check out your local chapter and uh, join. You get discounts being an EAA member. Uh, you get to attend club meetings and talk to other pilots and other builders. Um, get, and all the guys I met so far are awesome. Uh, two of them helped me come out and offload my kit, so that's great. You get to meet people that are willing to just show up and help you with that. Um, it's always nice to get them a drink or something afterwards, or maybe lunch. Um, unfortunately, the day we did it, everybody that was working with me, we were all sick. So it was like, do it and go home. <laughs> and then also, uh, you get a discount on going to EAA Oshkosh, which is really awesome. Uh, hopefully it's not canceled this year. We'll we'll see. So it's a, and you, um, you can get discounts on renters insurance and stuff like that. And they also have a lot of great resources to help you do this type of stuff, like webinars and um, all kinds of stuff, like the EA tables. I, I've searched for that, and they had that design uploaded on their website, so it was really easy to just take it and build it. And a lot of their stuff is free, but it's great to uh, buy a membership and support them so that they can keep doing what they're doing and they're a great advocate for amateur built aircraft as well as aviation in general. And that's about all I have so like I said hit that uh, subscribe button if you enjoyed this video please like it it helps out and if you're thinking about getting into an RV and feel like these videos are helping you please feel free to send Vans my uh, builder number and information when you buy your kit that way Vans will give me a hundred dollars as a finder's fee, doesn't cost you anything extra, and uh, I will make sure to put that money towards buying parts for this aircraft. It's not like I'm just going to stick it in my pocket unless I've already finished the build. At which point, I mean, I wouldn't mind the hundred bucks, but I, I'd probably recommend it, giving it to somebody who's actively building. And uh, that only works on the first kit you buy for the first aircraft that you build from Vans. If you're a repeat offender, or if I'm a repeat offender, we get a, a pretty Okay, de decent discount from what I've heard. I uh, haven't checked it out yet. I guess I'll find more information on that after I finish the build. And if Van sees that it's flying, I'm sure they'll start sending me some information on, hey, you need to start building your second airplane. Uh, from what I've seen, if I do go that route, I'll copy 10 from up in Wisconsin and probably build an RV-14. Um, it's one of Van's newest designs and it looks like a fantastic aircraft. I guess if you don't need a four place, I would probably go with the 14. It looks like it might be the better cross-country machine compared to the RV-9, which was kind of designed from the ground up as a cross-country machine. And uh, it is side-by-side, -side, which is better usually for friends sharing a flight instead of tandem. And then also it uh, has acrobatic capabilities. Can't go wrong with that. If you're looking for something a little bit more tame, go with the RV-12. It's a uh, two-seat but a step up from almost every aspect of the Cessna 172 performance wise. So a great aircraft and really quick to build because you're using blind rivets for most of the construction, if not all the construction. And that one's fairly cheap and the kits include absolutely everything you need to do the build. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.
Only irritating thing that I've found so far, far about these drill bits is uh, normally bits are marked on the shank what size they are. I left this chucked in the drill since last time I drilled and I just realized there's no such marking on here. So about the only thing I can do is maybe open the packages, see which one only has five in it, and then I know it's that size. Um, my other suggestion would be as soon as you're done using the drill bit, put it back so you can keep track of what size it is. I had a package sitting here in the garage. I guess my uh, wife dropped it off for me from fans. And this whole time I've been wondering uh, when I would get my missing parts. And it looks like they came in and the garage was open. Probably because the kids were playing, so my wife set it in here on the workbench and then uh, possibly told me about it and I wasn't listening. So I got rivet bag 1104, which is the one I was missing. So we'll get there. So we can check that off. And this is left elevator rib E905, which there were supposed to be two of them, and I only had received one, and that matches. So I'll check that off. Check those two items off the list, and we are good. We have all our parts now. Uh, basically, no more excuses on putting off building anything, although I hadn't needed those parts yet. And that's one nice thing about inventory early. Call them immediately. And unless you're missing one of the, these key pieces right here, you're probably going to get whatever you're missing before you even have a chance to need it. That should be in subkit 5. Yep, E905. I now have two of them. So, inventory list is complete. I'm still keeping this in the front of the folder though. That way, anytime it says, hey, get this part. Usually it's faster to locate it on here. Um, mainly when I'm scanning through this I'm looking for the first two letters because those are fairly unique. So it'll be like VS for vertical stabilizer. So there's one piece. And then I just go to that subkit. Here's uh, three more pieces. Here's two more pieces of the vertical stabilizer. So all the vertical stabilizer pieces aren't in one subkit. It's just a question of how all the pieces fit together so they can be all wrapped up. But it's really easy to go through there and find VS. And then when you get to the horizontal stabilizer, same thing. It's real easy to go through here and find HS. And then from there, you just look and see. Usually they're in, in sets. And you can just go look in, at the end numbers at that point and go like, hey, here, the part I need is in subkit 8. And if you sorted it out like I did and labeled each subkit, you're going to spend maybe 45 seconds to 60 seconds looking for a part most of the time. Don't underestimate organizing that way. And keep your parts organized and it makes it go a lot faster. You're not wandering around your shop, which I don't have all that space to wander around in anyway. I've got maybe like a 15 by 8 foot area to look for parts in right now because I have a whole bunch of lawn equipment, my motorcycle in here, some end tables that I was working on, so I don't really have a place to spread out yet. So organization unpacking this kit was uh, really key for me, and it seems to help out a lot. So my recommendation is to do it that way. But of course, I did it that way, so I'm a little bit biased towards it. But hopefully seeing me find parts that quickly will uh, convince you that's probably the best way to go about it. And I'm really thankful that Vans started putting these in subkits. I guess that wasn't always the case.